take their favorite video game everywhere they go. Do it, do jump, do hop, hop. Skip it, skip it. Skip it and a jump and a bop, bop. 1992. A famed long-running RPG series hits its fourth entry. Released this week in October of 1992, was Dragon Warrior 4. Dragon Warrior 4 is as RPG as it gets for an NES game. Travel around with your party of characters, get into random battles, level up, get equipment and experience an epic story. Ambitiously different for this one though was having multiple playable heroes. The game was divided into multiple chapters, each with their own protagonist in a different part of the world. Finish all those chapters and you unlock a final chapter where all the heroes come together for a final showdown. It also meant having to pick your favorite characters to make your final party. Originally titled Dragon Quest 4 in Japan, here in America we always knew the series as Dragon Warrior until it fixed itself with the release of Dragon Quest 8 for the PlayStation 2. Which for simplicity, I'm just gonna say Dragon Quest from now on. Dragon Quest was huge in Japan. So big that sometimes when a new entry came out, schools would just close themselves because so many students kept being mysteriously sick all at the same time. In the West, less hyped up. It was always enjoyable and had its fan base, but it never quite cracked the upper echelon of beloved NES games. It also could be because Dragon Quest IV had a few more annoyances compared to the previous excellent game, Dragon Quest III. For example, in the final chapter, you can only control the main hero that you chose. The rest do whatever the AI tells it to do. This leads to all kinds of frustrations, such as when Chiral, a healer character, would keep trying to cast instant death spells that don't work until he's out of magic points. This was such a problem and fans hated it so much that they actually mocked it a bit in a spin-off series, Dragon Quest Heroes. Leading up to its release, Dragon Quest IV was pretty much entirely looked over, primarily because by this time, all eyes were on the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. Nintendo Power would cover the game, in March of 1993. What reviews it did get were positive though. GamePro Magazine liked it, but did note how little visual improvements the fourth game made, even compared to the previous one. It even teases at the end that players should look forward to the 16-bit sequel. And that never happened. Dragon Quest IV was the last Dragon Quest game published by Enix's American branch before they closed in 1995. The West would not see another Dragon Quest game until Dragon Quest VII, still called Dragon Warrior VII, for the PlayStation 1 in 2001. Thankfully, Dragon Quest IV has been remade and ported a few times. It was remade for the PlayStation 1 in Japan and completely remade again for the Nintendo DS in September 2008. Finally, properly called Dragon Quest IV. The DS version would also then get ported to Android and iOS devices in 2014, which you can play right now. One of the world's oldest cartoon icons got a new game released this week in 1992, was Felix the Cat for the NES. Felix the Cat is, what else, a platformer starring the cartoon hero. Felix can run and jump, collecting Felix icons for an extra life, and use his magic bag to deploy different tricks to defeat enemies. He can collect power-ups to change his magic powers to being in different vehicles like a bike thing to a tank. It's also incredibly easy, and the game passes out extra lives like it's candy. Despite its simplicity, publisher Hudson Soft treated Felix like it was a big deal. It was even advertised then that he was the world's most famous cat. Which, maybe, but these days, he isn't a meme like Garfield is. The game was also a big enough deal that Nintendo Power featured the game on their 40th issue. Or Hudson Soft paid for that, one of the two. You'd be forgiven thinking that this was the start of a new Felix the Cat renaissance with an all new series and the like. And there would be a new cartoon, The Twisted Tales of Felix the Cat, in 1995. It lasted two seasons. So the NES game, as an attempt to get kids to love Felix alongside Mickey Mouse and Mario, fell flat. Still, the game reviewed well. GamePro Magazine issue 39 gave it incredibly high marks and praised it for being a great game for beginners. But it didn't sell well. Since then, Felix the Cat has been relegated to merchandise known more to boomers than gamers. There were talks of another new TV show and comic book line but those went nowhere. While the NES got a kid-friendly platformer, Sega got the exact opposite. Released this week in 1992 was Death Duel 
for the Sega Genesis. Death Duel is a gallery shooter where you move the cursor on screen and shoot at the opposing enemy. Only here, it is hyper violent. You shoot off the limbs of enemies, their heads, body parts go flying, blood splattering on the ground. In between levels, you spend your murder cash to upgrade your robot murder machine. Advertisements for Death Duel even stated that it's not suggested for children under 14. This is because of the violence, but it's also because before the start of every match, a blonde will woman in booty shorts walks out with a noticeably see-through top, wiggling her hips, and says things like, hit him so hard his family bleeds, and nothing fina than ripping out his spina. If you think that's awful, you should see the game over screen. It is one of the most savage screens I've ever seen to demoralize any player. Once you die, the game says, your defeat has brought chaos to the Federation. Your cowardice and betrayal shall be known throughout the stars. Your decaying corpse will be an object for ridicule and scorn, disgrace will follow your family for centuries, and it, it just kind of keeps going. Despite the clearly juvenile appeal, Death Duel was received positively. GamePro Magazine said, quote, Death Duel's looks do kill, and the blood factor's out of sight with generally high scores. As for now, the game is dull. The gameplay is too simplistic, slow-paced, and uninteresting. If it wasn't for the occasional blood and just a hint of nipple, no kid would have found this fun to play back then either. I don't think I've ever seen a cartridge of this game in person either, so I'm not convinced people actually owned it in the 90s. And as far as we can tell, Death Duel has never been ported or re-released for anything, making it available only in Sega Genesis cartridge form. Beloved to some, mocked by others, released 30 years ago was Final Fantasy Mystic Quest for the Super Nintendo. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest is a turn-based fantasy RPG where you play as Benjamin, collecting four treasures of the elements. Battles use command-based menus with rotating second party members, getting experience points, and leveling up. Rather than purchasing or equipping new weapons and armor though, they are automatically upgraded as they are found throughout the adventure, all while going to towns, talking to NPCs, and discovering the epic story. Recall, if you will, that it was dubbed that 1992 was the year of the SNES RPG. One of the games spearheading this initiative was Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. However, the RPG genre was not big in the West. So Square developed Mystic Quest in Japan specifically for the American market. They believed that RPGs were just too hard for the Americans to get into, which is also why the US version of Final Fantasy IV, or II, whatever, was significantly easier than the Japanese original. That's also why Final Fantasy Mystic Quest is a baby game for babies. It was not only conceived for a younger audience in mind, it was also made incredibly easy for kids to understand. To also help kids feel like they're getting into some action quicker, you can swing your weapons outside of battle, which can be used for some puzzle-solving elements. The story also has tons of jokes, it's light-hearted, and is a pretty short playthrough. Also, battles weren't random. All the enemies appear on the overworld, and you can jump, allowing you to avoid enemy fights whenever you want to. The world map is also a simple level select, like something out of Super Mario World. I've already made an entire video dedicated to Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, like a lot of years ago, feel free to revisit that for my full opinion on it. Viewers from Europe may be confused by what I'm talking about here. In Europe, there already was a game from Square called Mystic Quest, which we know as Final Fantasy Adventure, which is actually Seiken Densetsu, aka Adventures of Mana. So in Europe, this had its name changed to Mystic Quest Legend and doesn't mention Final Fantasy at all. Despite trying to appeal to kids, the advertisements for Final Fantasy Mystic Quest basically insulted the intelligence of the reader, saying things like, an out-of-body experience, get a brain transplant, idiot, or drain your brain pan with a head lube and oil change. It also states how anyone who purchases the game can use a coupon inside the box to get a free strategy guide. Upon release, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest reviewed well. Magazines such as GamePro Magazine rated the game highly, noting that it's perfect for button mashers to discover the RPG genre and a decent stopgap for Final Fantasy fans. Mystic Quest went mostly ignored by both American and Japanese audiences. When it came to broadening the appeal of RPG games, it failed. Oddly, that goal would not be realized 
until Final Fantasy VII. Mystic Quest wasn't entirely forgotten though. It got ported to the Nintendo Wii's Virtual Console in 2010. There was a fan-developed HD remake of Mystic Quest until Square Enix shut that down. And for whatever it's worth, Benjamin appears in Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy Curtain Call, the second game in the series on the Nintendo 3DS, where he is a playable party member and two Mystic Quest battle themes as selectable songs. This next game is one you've definitely seen before, even if you don't realize it yet. Also released this week in 1992 was Phalanx for the SNES. Phalanx is a side-scrolling shoot-em-up. You play as a spaceship blasting every single thing that comes your way, picking up power-ups and fighting bosses. You can stock up to three different weapons and power them up individually or change your ship's speed at will in the pause menu. Also, you don't instantly die after one hit and can even find some health replenishing items along the way. There's also a cheat code that allows you to change the game's difficulty mode to funny, as in it becomes so absurdly difficult that it's funny. Phalanx, however, blends right in alongside every other space themed shoot 'em up on the SNES. It doesn't do enough to be worth someone's money or stand out. Which is why Kemco sought to remedy that by making the weirdest box art they could. This is it. It's just an old guy sitting on a porch playing a banjo making a weird face at you and you can barely even notice this spaceship flying across. You've seen this before. This is one of those games that was always available at the rental store because the box art was so weird, none of us wanted to try it. Phalanx was originally on the X68000 computer, a giant beast of a PC from the late 80s. It didn't sell well on there, so they had to come up with something for the SNES port. As revealed by one of the people behind the cover, Matt Gus, he and his associate, Keith Campbell, were tasked to create a cover so that it would stand out among all the other SNES games. Their actual plan was to give it the weirdest cover art they possibly could, which I would say they succeeded, considering we still talk about that cover art to this day. Phalanx would receive some ports and re-releases, including a version on the Game Boy Advance. Sadly, the box art is just as bland as the game is. A wrestling game on the SNES, but only with giant monsters. Released this week in 1992 was King of the Monsters for the Super Nintendo. King of the Monsters is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game starring different kaiju, with some clearly inspired by Godzilla and King Kong. It plays more like a wrestling game than just a fighter, with plenty of suplexes and grappling. The edge of the ring is electrified and will bounce anyone right back in. To win a match, you also need to pin them to a count of three. There's also lots of destruction to whatever city you're fighting on, and you can even pick up buildings or boats to attack the other with. After every single time you collect a power-up or grapple a guy, they'll celebrate by flexing or intensely headbanging. King of the Monsters was originally released as a Neo Geo game last year. The arcades and home Neo Geo AES got King of the Monsters 2 just a couple of months ago, so the SNES versions were lagging behind a bit. The port itself is also lackluster. It doesn't have the graphics and sound effects for that real oomph of the arcade original, and it's missing two of the playable characters. At its release, even Nintendo Power reviewed it with an average score of only 3.2 out of 5. But it didn't stop me from renting it a ton as a kid. I loved the city destruction, and around that time, I was watching a ton of movies like Godzilla and Gamera. So the giant monster aesthetic really appealed to me. My favorite guy was Beatlemania. That said, the console ports aren't very good, and you should stick with the Neo Geo versions whenever you can. A Sega Genesis version of King of the Monsters would come out later next year. The SNES and Sega ports never got a re-release of any kind, but they would both get a home version of King of the Monsters 2. The Neo Geo original was included in SNK Arcade Classics Volume 1 for the PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, and Nintendo Wii, which is also now available for download on the Nintendo Switch. Some of the King of the Monsters characters also show up in SNK vs. Capcom Card Fighters for the Neo Geo Pocket and Nintendo DS, and make appearances in Neo Geo Battle Coliseum, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game featuring tons of Neo Geo characters. As far as new games though, since 2008, we've never seen the King of the Monsters ever again. This is the Dr. Dreadful Drink Lab. <laughs> Makes lots of gross things that taste great. Magic liquid and care for a putrid potion. No. Not quite a new generation of consoles, not quite a simple accessory. Released on October 15th, 1992, was the Sega CD. Hey! 
You still don't have a Sega CD? Huh? What are you waiting for, Nintendo to make one? <laughs> you have seen the games, right? Uh, Wrong answer, man. Show them! <laughs> Want to see more? <laughs> Sega! The Sega CD is an add-on that attaches to the Sega Genesis, or the Mega Drive. This allows you to play all new Sega CD games, which often boasted better graphics, CD quality sound, and lots of cinematic movies. Or, as they described it, movie graphics, rock and roll concert sound, and 3D animation. Now, in the 90s, CD-ROMs were just starting to become the standard medium for media. People were already familiar with music CDs starting in the mid-80s, but computer games being placed onto them was a pretty new thing. The Sega CD was not the first home video game console to play CD games, that would be the TurboGrafx CD, but that didn't have much of a foothold in the market. So there was tons of hype with the upcoming Sega CD. Everyone had been talking about the Sega CD since the middle of 1991, and everyone knew that there was going to be a new Sonic the Hedgehog CD game, even before Sonic 2 was out. And perhaps the most exciting part, the Sega CD could play your music CDs right out of your television. That is as big of a deal as when the PlayStation 2 could play DVD movies. As the console war continued to boil, this was going to be the tipping point into Sega's favor. The actual launch of the Sega CD was nothing but problems. For one, Sega of Japan was so paranoid of leaks or technical details reaching the public or, God forbid, Nintendo, that they were incredibly secretive of the hardware. As such, Sega of America wasn't even getting development units for them to research and test until way too late. By the time they finally got actual hardware, all they had were issues. As former Sega of America producer Scott Bayless put it, some of the units would literally burst into flames. At its release, there were only 50,000 units of the Sega CD available, compared to the millions of Sega Genesis's already sold in the West. There was also a severe lack of games made specifically for the Sega CD, mostly because Sega of Japan's paranoia made them too slow to get software development kits out to publishers and developers. There was also the issue of cost. The Sega CD released with a retail price of 299 US dollars, which also required a Genesis to even use it in the first place. The games themselves didn't exactly offer too much innovation. There were lots of ports of Genesis titles like Echo the Dolphin and Batman Returns. It also had a lot of Hollywood movie games, as they put it, featuring a lot of FMVs of real actors. After all, when everyone is trying to have the best graphics possible, Graphics can't get any better than real people. The games available at launch were Sewer Shark, Marky Mark, Make My Video, INXS, Make My Video, Chuck Rock, Cobra Command, and Black Hole Assault. Bundled with the unit itself was Sega Classics 4-in-1, Soul Feast, and the FMB showcase game, Sherlock Holmes, consulting detective. However, the Sega CD would also go on to have legendary games. Games like Snatcher, Popful Mail, Lunar Silver Story, Sonic CD. The Sega CD did have its fan base with some awesome games, assuring that the CD-ROM format was to be the standard for home video games a few years before the PlayStation made that a reality. And people may not remember the Sega CD itself, but we do remember its games for better or worse, because some of those games are infamous, with no better example than Night Trap. Night Trap was a launch title for the Sega CD in the West, releasing alongside it on October 15th, 1992. It is the perfect example of awful, cheesy FMV games that plagued the system. A bunch of teenage girls are having a sleepover, and bizarre black-clad kidnappers or vampires break their way in to snatch them away. As a member of SCAT, you swap between numerous video feeds and activate traps found throughout the home to protect the partying women. It's basically a movie you watch pressing quick time event buttons to not not die. It was essentially Dragon's Lair with bad pop music and 80s fashion. Development for Night Trap took only six months, with most of that going to filming and editing. It was also not developed for the Sega CD at all. It was originally meant for an all-new gaming console from Hasbro called 
Control Vision. A few games were made for the Control Vision until Hasbro abruptly canceled it in 1989, realizing that it would just be too expensive to compete against the NES. When it got canceled, this allowed the original Control Vision head developer, Tom Zito, to purchase the unreleased games to rework for the Sega CD. Sewer Shark and Night Trap. Night Trap was originally filmed in 1987, which explains why everyone looks like that. You can even find some of the prototype footage in the game itself thanks to a cheat code. At its release, Night Trap was both praised and condemned. GamePro Magazine gave it incredibly high remarks, saying how even non-Sega CD gamers can see the potential of the Sega CD technology. Others realized that the gameplay is really stupid, but you can get some laughs out of the awful cutscenes. Of course, the most notable thing that Night Trap did was be a primary contributor to the creation of the ESRB. In 1993, the United States Congress held hearings about rampant video game problems, that they're all overly violent, gory, and encourage sexual violence against women. Their primary targets of these criticisms were Mortal Kombat, Lethal Enforcers, and most infamously, Night Trap. Night Trap would later get ported to the Sega 32X, the 3DO, and the PC, all with improved graphics. It has also been placed onto many worst games of all time lists, which only made its popularity grow. A 25 year anniversary edition was then released for PC, PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, and Nintendo Switch in 2017. Hilariously, that anniversary edition of the game that was so horrific that it created the ESRB as we know it was rated T for teen. Still getting games late into its lifespan, released this week in October of 1992, was Panic Restaurant for the NES. Panic Restaurant is a side-scrolling action platformer. You play as a chef who looks suspiciously like Mario, who has his restaurant taken over by a chef who looks suspiciously like Waluigi. You walk and jump across the stages, using all kinds of kitchenware to beat all kinds of food-based enemies. Living carrots, roasted chickens, pizzas all stand in your way until you fight whatever boss at the end of the stage, also kitchen-themed. Much like Mario, if you get hit once, you lose whatever power-up you've acquired. It's a great-looking game! It makes full use of the NES hardware for both graphics and music. It also plays solidly well, making it one of the better platformers you can find for the system. At its release, it was reviewed pretty well. Once again, GamePro gave it above average review scores. Panic Restaurant is one of the select few games from publisher Taito that was released for the NES well after the Super Nintendo hit the market. It had a limited commercial release, with some speculation that it may have been a rental-only game. Either way, Panic Restaurant is now one of the rarest NES games you can have. One of the most famous sought after NES games and it has nothing to do with the game itself. Released on October 22nd, 1992, was Little Samson. Little Samson is a side-scrolling action platformer, running, jumping, and attacking to defeat enemies. You play as Little Samson, but can also play as his three friends, Kikira the Dragon, Gam the Golem, and Ko the Mouse. Each have their own abilities, like Kikira can fly, Gam is immune to spikes, and Ko is small and nimble. Similar to the original TMNT NES game, you can freely swap between the four characters at any time, each having their own health bar. As you play, you can find power-ups to upgrade a character's maximum health and poke to restore them whenever, which is helpful to have for the numerous bosses at the end of the stages. Gameplay-wise, Little Samson plays and controls very similar to something like Mega Man, which makes sense since it was developed by a few developers who left Capcom. The game director was Shinichi Yoshimoto, who previously worked on the arcade games Strider and Ghouls and Ghosts. It's easily one of the best games on the NES and often overlooked. The gameplay is tight and fun, sporting some of the most impressive graphics the NES could push out. Look at some of these bosses! There's so much detail in every frame of animation that even just visually, this stands out far above 90% of the NES games out there. It's really good. Around this time, everyone was all about mascot characters. Nintendo had Mario, Sega had Sonic, Capcom had Mega Man. Publisher Taito was looking for a mascot that they could call their own. So when developer Takaru had this Little Samson game, Taito thought 
this could be their ticket in. However, almost zero marketing went into Little Samson's release. No television commercials, no magazine ads, nary a mention in the back of instruction manuals from other games. The most it got was a Nintendo Power issue 40, where it had a walkthrough spanning a few pages. Upon release, Little Samson reviewed not as well as you'd think. Nintendo Power themselves gave it only a 3.5 out of 5. To say that Little Samson sold poorly would be an understatement. It barely sold at all. It quickly became one of the rarest NES games of all time. Through word of mouth about its rarity, Little Samson became more well known primarily as a collectible. It's also not available on any other platform or digital media. Another week, another movie tie-in game, also released this week in 1992, was Alien 3 for the Sega Genesis. Alien 3 is a side-scrolling run-and-gun game based on the Alien 3 movie, which released in May of 1992. In it, you play as Ellen Ripley, running through a prison colony, blasting away aliens, picking up new weapons, accessing doors, and crawling through vents. The main goal is to rescue all the other surviving prisoners and then reach the exit all within a time limit. And if that wasn't stressful enough, you have limited ammo. It's actually a pretty sweet game. The time limit is a bit more forgiving than you would think, and having to be resourceful with weaponry and ammunition Ammunition gives a bit more thought to the usual run and gun gameplay. Review outlets were also impressed. The all new Game Fan magazine awarded it with the best movie game of the year. GamePro Magazine rated it with a near-perfect score. The Alien 3 video game would get ported to numerous platforms. In 1993, there would be a version made for the NES, SNES, Game Boy, and Game Gear, and a UK exclusive version for the Sega Master System. Your eyes are not deceiving you! This is a good game, and it was published by LJN. Some games are based on movies, others are based on real life events. Released this week in 1992 was Desert Strike Return to the Gulf for the SNES. Desert Strike is an isometric action game where you control an attack helicopter, flying around a map and blasting away specific targets, enemy tanks, gun towers, and rescuing prisoners. Innovative for its time was that the objectives could be completed in any order, and for what was essentially a shoot 'em up you could roam and explore freely around the map. It's less frantic and more strategic, as it's easy to take too much damage and be shot down, or to run out of ammo or fuel. Desert Strike drew a lot of criticism due to its proximity to the very real Gulf War, in which the USA had invaded Iraq the first time. There were even claims that veterans were burning copies of the game. However, Desert Strike began development years before the war even started, and it was originally based on the Lebanese Civil War. It was designed entirely by Mike Posen, who had never worked on a video game before. His goal was to make a nonlinear helicopter game inspired by Choplifter for the Atari 5200, and to make all the vehicles look like the Matchbox toys he played with as a kid. I love this game. This was another one of those SNES games that I rented all the time as a kid, having also played with similar Matchbox military vehicle toys. It's also hard, and I never got past the first stage. Review outlets also loved it. GamePro Magazine rated it highly, not with scores, but just with excited faces. Electronic Gaming Monthly also scored it with an average of a 7 out of 10, and Desert Strike shot up the sales charts and stayed at the top 10 for some months, which, at the time, was the best selling game ever for Electronic Arts. It was originally released on the Sega Genesis in March of 1992, and proved to be such a huge hit, it made publisher EA quickly make ports for the SNES, Amiga, Atari Lynx, Game Boy, Game Gear, and Sega Master System. All the ports did get some slight censorship, as the Sega Genesis original has a scene of a prisoner being lured into a barrel of acid, whereas the others have them being shot dead in a cage? which I guess is more humane, or whatever. Desert Strike would go on to get some sequels. Jungle Strike in 1993, Urban Strike in 1994, Soviet Strike in 1996, and finally, Nuclear Strike in 1997. Desert Strike would also get ported to the Game Boy Advance in 2002, and the last we saw it was on the EA Replay Collection for the PSP in 2006. No way, slime face. Whoa! Watch out for that first step. Uh one of the best-selling Game Boy games of all time, released November 2nd, 1992, was Super Mario Land 2 
Six Golden Coins. Super Mario Land 2 sees Mario doing what Mario does best, running and jumping on enemies while grabbing some power-ups along the way. There are six zones with six bosses he needs to defeat to reclaim the six golden coins, allowing him to re-enter his castle, which has been stolen by the dastardly new villain, Wario. Gameplay is much closer to what people would expect from a Mario game. Super Mario Land 1 was weird. Koopas became bombs when they were jumped on. The Fire Flower gave Mario a bouncy ball attack. There were shoot 'em up levels. Almost as a response to that, Super Mario Land 2 is much more traditional and sought to play closer to the immensely popular Super Mario World. The character sprites were made much bigger, the fire flower shot fire balls, and now Mario could spin jump to destroy certain blocks below him. Without colors available on the Game Boy, some changes still had to be made. For example, a 1-Up mushroom looks exactly like a normal mushroom, so 1-Ups became hearts. And to signify that Mario has the fire flower power-up, instead of changing colors, he instead gets a feather in his hat. Or a stick? A flower stem? You know what? What is that? I could never actually tell. Also, all new was the carrot, giving Mario bunny ears, which he could flap to slow his descent, similar to the raccoon tail of Mario 3. A major gameplay innovation was that Super Mario Land 2 was non-linear. It had an overworld like Super Mario World, but the levels and zones could be completed in any order. You can go straight to Pumpkin Zone, fly out to Space Zone, or start with the ever-popular Mario Zone, where everything is toys. Super Mario Land 2, like the first one, had zero input from Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto. Instead, it was produced by Gunpei Yokoi, who is most known for his work on Metroid 2 Return of Samus and for essentially creating the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy. I love this one for my Game Boy. I didn't like the original Mario Land for how weird it was, so as a kid, it made me ecstatic that this game was more like a normal Mario game. Reviews at the time also loved it, with glowing scores across the board. With the exception of Nintendo Power, who rated it with only a 3.7 out of 5. They must have changed their minds though, because they still named it the best Game Boy game of 1992, and would eventually call Super Mario Land 2 the 7th best Game Boy game of all time. Of course, the most impactful thing Super Mario Land 2 ever did was create Wario. Obey me, Wario. I am your master. Mario is your enemy. The wicked imposter Wario has cast an evil spell over Mario Land. Don't let Mario get the six golden coins. Don't let Mario reach the palace. This is the biggest, most dangerous, most challenging Game Boy adventure yet. Obey Wario. Destroy Mario. Don't fall under Wario's evil spell in Super Mario Land 2. Only on Game Boy. He made for a fascinating final boss at the time, as you had to face a boss using the exact same power-ups that Mario used. Somehow, Wario ended up proving so popular that a new game was created to focus on him. Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3 in 1994. Unsure of how well he'd do on his own, Nintendo kept the Super Mario Land subtitle just in case. His next game would actually be Wario Land for the Virtual Boy in 1995, and then Wario Land 2 for the Game Boy in 1998, with Wario Land 3 and 4 in the coming years, while also spitting himself off into the WarioWare game series beginning in 2003. Wario is now one of Nintendo's franchise characters able to stand on his own, all thanks to his villainous debut, in Super Mario Land 2. Another niche arcade game makes its way to homes. Also released was Super Buster Brothers for the Super Nintendo. Super Buster Brothers has you going through numerous levels armed with a harpoon gun, busting bouncing bubbles in every stage. Every time a bubble is popped, it splits into smaller ones, taking quick reactions and aiming to make them hit your shot. Power-ups can also be obtained, like getting a protective shield or a Vulcan gun. It comes with two game modes, Tour Mode, which has levels vaguely themed on locations around the world, and Panic Mode, which is essentially an endless survival mode. Super Buster Brothers is actually a sequel. The original was released by Capcom in the arcades in 1989 and was called Buster Brothers. In Europe, however, the game series is known as Pang, with the SNES title called Super Pang. I think the North American name is better. It also allowed us to get advertisements to say things like, the Buster Brothers are hunting balls and bagging profits. There was a major omission with the home release of Super Buster Brothers. The main characters, which have always been guys who look like archeologists or explorers, were changed to two totally rad 90s kids with sunglasses on the cover. More importantly, despite having brothers in the title, the SNES game is only single player. It's Super Buster Brother. 
Just one. I still have a lot of fun with the game, though. It scratches that same itch that a game like Arkanoid does. Super Buster Brothers would go on to get a sequel called Buster Buddies. However, it would not be seen in the West until the Buster Brothers collection for the PlayStation 1 in 1997. The series would then formally adopt the Pang name for all releases, starting with Mighty Pang in 2000, with the most recent entry in the series being Pang Adventures in 2016, and is still available for download on Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, and Nintendo Switch. Breaking free of arcade restraints, more kicks and punches abound. Released for the Super Nintendo in October 1992, was Super Double Dragon. Super Double Dragon is a side-scrolling beat-em-up starring THE Double Dragon, Billy and Jimmy Lee. As enemies show up, you can punch, kick, grab, and throw them to take them out, sometimes picking up additional weapons to get to the end of several stages. Major changes for the series include an all-new block and counter button. By pressing the button with a well-timed press, you can counter an enemy attack. You can also press and hold a button to charge up to do different special attacks, including their hurricane kick from Double Dragon 3. Super Double Dragon is fundamentally Double Dragon 4. However, for the first time, it isn't based on any arcade game. It's an original title developed with the intent of being just on the Super Nintendo. This also means the usual arcade cheapness isn't as prevalent. I actually really like this game. I liked using the counter button and the improved animations made it feel more like proper martial arts instead of street brawling. That said, it does feel pretty slow and sluggish when compared to the previous games. Super Double Dragon released in America first, and is notably the worst version of Super Double Dragon. It was pretty much rushed to the market and had several things cut just to make it on time. Lead game designer Muneki Ibinuma detailed what they lost due to time constraints in 2004. For example, there were supposed to be cutscenes at the start and in between levels detailing the plot of the game. Instead, there are none whatsoever. So there is no context as to who you're fighting or why. Marion was supposed to appear as a police officer who assisted the Lee brothers in investigating whatever shadow organization. She's mentioned in the instruction manual, but does not show up in the game at all. Perhaps the worst is that when you defeat the final boss, it goes straight to credits. No cutscene, no victory music, just... It's over. Many of these things were restored or remedied for the Japanese release of the game, now titled Return of Double Dragon. Other tweaks included being able to adjust the difficulty and Billy and Jimmy having different attack combos than each other. Also, when you throw a boomerang, you can catch it when it comes back. Whereas in the American Super Double Dragon, you hit yourself. A long time ago, 30 years to be exact, the Super Nintendo saw the release of Super Star Wars. Super Star Wars is a hit from the burning deserts of Tantooine, the maze-like interior of a sand crawler, the Moss Eisley bar, to your final confrontation with the awesome Death Star. All the action from the movie is here, but the outcome is up to you. Do you have what it takes to take on the Empire? Find out with Super Star Wars, available now. Super Star Wars is an action platformer following the events of Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. Play as Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Chewbacca through numerous levels based on the film. You'll start in the sands of Tatooine, acquire a lightsaber, fly off to the Death Star, and end with the final trench run. Gameplay is closer to something like Contra, where you're shooting away a constant barrage of enemies, powering up your blaster, and using screen-clearing grenades. There's also a handful of Mode 7 stages for variety, piloting Luke's Land speeder and X Wing. Super Star Wars is called Super, not strictly because it's Star Wars on the Super Nintendo, it's to help differentiate it from the previously released Star Wars for the NES, to help show that it's a different game. It was developed by Sculptured Software along with LucasArts, which naturally got them a lot of advantages during production. For example, Sculptured Software's in house music composer, Paul Webb was given the original sheet music that John Williams had created for the film's musical score. During development, there was some cut content. Originally, magazine scans showed that there was going to be a level based on the Death Star trash compactor that never made it in because the cartridge couldn't fit it. There were also ports being made for both the Sega Genesis and for the PC, 
both of which were canceled before the release, meaning a lot of Star Wars fans missed out. Although both of those canceled versions have now been leaked online. I actually hate this game. It's way too difficult with some infuriating platforming and unfun level design. Anyone who's tried to get past the sand crawler stage knows exactly what I'm talking about. Despite it being a run and gun game, there are so many enemies that take multiple shots to kill that it's much better and safer to move at a snail's pace. You have to stand still to shoot, and jumping is really stilted and awkward. Also, I want to bring your attention to the title screen for Super Star Wars for a second. What is happening to Luke Skywalker's face? Why is his jaw unhinged and off to the side and practically melting off? Despite what I think, reviewers at the time loved it. GamePro Magazine gave it a perfect score. Nintendo Power rated it with an average score of a 4.1 out of 5 and called it the fourth best SNES game of 1992, ahead of games like Soul Blazer and Super Mario Kart. Reviews used to make no sense at the time. Super Star Wars would eventually be followed up with, what else, Super Empire Strikes Back and Super Return of the Jedi. They remained exclusive to the SNES until they were put onto the Wii's Virtual Console service in 2009, and in 2015, a bundle of classic Star Wars games were ported to the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation Vita. It includes all of the SNES Star Wars games. In games that you've definitely never heard of, released this week for the Nintendo Game Boy, was Out of Gas. Out of Gas is a top-down space shooter of sorts where your ship is constantly running out of gas, flying around to find all the gas icons, many of which need to be collected in order, and use your cannons to shoot other enemies. Every time you take damage, you lose more gas, reducing the time you have to complete each level. It controls like the classic Asteroids game, only with puzzle elements, and it's stupid. The only real enjoyable part of the game is the cutscenes. Surprisingly, well-animated cutscenes play in between each world, setting up the story of each level, which, as far as I can tell, is a space guy taking his space girlfriend out on a space drive, only, oops, he's out of gas. He even gives the camera a thumbs up like, ha, now she has no choice but to make out with him, and there are so many layers of wrong here. Nobody likes this game. The kindest review out there was from Nintendo Power, who gave it a too high of a score of a 2.9 out of 5. But hey, the art style of the cutscenes sure are something. Out of Gas was developed by Real Time Associates, who you may know better for working on other games such as Elmo's Letter Adventure, Elmo's Number Journey, and the Nintendo 64 version of Gex Enter the Gecko. For an actually cool game released this week in 1992 was Firepower 2000, for the Super Nintendo. Firepower 2000 is a shoot 'em up set during a war in the far future of 1997. The screen scrolls vertically as you blast away every single thing that comes your way. A major gameplay difference is that there are two playable vehicles the helicopter, which plays very familiar to any other shoot 'em up game, and the tank, which can shoot in all eight directions but has to drive around enemies and obstacles and can jump. Also, during certain stages, you'll change vehicles entirely, like swapping to a speedboat. It also has two player support, allowing one player and each vehicle for some slightly different play styles. It's actually a pretty cool game! It's easy to think that every shoot 'em up is like all the others, but there's enough variety with the vehicle selection to keep you engaged. Firepower 2000 is actually a sequel to a different game called Swiv, which was released for numerous PCs in 1991. Firepower 2000 was titled Super Swiv outside of the US. It would get ported to the Mega Drive in Europe in 1994 and renamed Mega Swiv, with a sequel on PC called Swiv 3D. Firepower 2000 got a surprising amount of coverage in gaming magazines. There were numerous advertisements for it, and Nintendo Power Issue 44 had a multi-page walkthrough. And at release, Electronic Gaming Monthly rated it highly with eights all around, except for one guy who gave it a six, citing that breakup is a big no-no, which I don't actually know what that means even in this context. Therefore, we can only assume that he's still bitter that he got dumped by Firepower 2000. Swinging their way onto the SNES this week in 1992 with a pronounced snicket was Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge. Tired of the same old fun and games? <laughs> Welcome Spider-Man X-Men to the video game ride of your lives! Wolverine, Spider-Man, Gambit, Cyclops... Now on Genesis, the ultimate video game team! Are we having fun yet? 
Spider-Man and the X-Men stars a playable Spider-Man and four X-Men, Cyclops, Storm, Wolverine, and Gambit. Each plays differently with their own unique powers. Spider-Man's web swinging, Cyclops' optic blasts, Wolverine's claws and healing, Gambit's cards, and Storm's, uh, swimming. The lesser known villain Arcade has captured them all into his series of death traps, each designed for that hero. There's plenty of platforming, robot destruction, and a host of familiar Marvel villains showing up like Shocker, Sentinels, and the Juggernaut. The game is also notoriously difficult. There's lots of instant death traps for several of the stages, brutal enemy placement, and not many health power-ups to go around. You have to pass two stages for every character, plus one last final level, complete with boss fights, all on two lives, shared amongst all of them, and no continues. It's also honestly fun at times. All the characters play uniquely, and that's genuinely enjoyable. I've already done an entire separate video on this game and my grievances with it, so feel free to give that another watch. Now, in the 90s, Spider-Man and the X-Men were a really big deal, as both had an incredibly successful animated series. Contrary to popular belief, however, this game was not created as a response to those successful cartoons. X-Men the Animated Series premiered on Fox Kids on October 31st, 1992, and the Spider-Man Animated Series would not debut until November of 1994. The video game was just a separate idea someone had, though some tie-in comics were created as a means to help promote the video game. The game would eventually get ported to the Sega Genesis in 1990 and to the Game Boy and the Game Gear in 1994. Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge was developed by Acclaim Entertainment's Software Creations and published by LJN. Yes, that LJN. The game was wrought with issues during development, according to Richard K of Software Creations, stating that Spider-Man and X-Men started going horribly wrong and Acclaim were screaming at us and threatening litigation and we ended up with three teams on this one game. The game was released to the public essentially unfinished, knowingly rough around the edges, and often unfair. This didn't go unnoticed by reviewers at the time either. Electronic Gaming Monthly Issue 41 gave it mostly favorable reviews, but also said things like, there's not enough enemies and that the music isn't very good? Excuse me? The music was done by Greg and Tim Fallon and is easily the best part of the entire game for how impressively awesome it is. Reviews used to make no sense at the time. Speaking of licensed games that are way better than they ever should be, released this week in 1992, was Home Alone for the Sega Genesis. Home Alone is based on the hit film from 1990 starring Macaulay Culkin. In it, a young boy's family travels for Christmas and accidentally leaves Kevin behind in his massive upper-class family home. Two bandits arrive to steal from the house as much as possible, but not before Kevin can set up a series of toy-based traps for hijinks, slapstick comedy, and blunt force trauma. Home Alone, the video game for the Genesis, follows the plot pretty close. You play as Kevin traveling around the neighborhood using his fan-powered sled from the movie. Instead of just one home to defend, there are several. You can freely explore and enter any of the houses, collecting weapons and objects to set up traps for the wet bandits. Once the bandits experience enough pain, they'll leave for a brief while, giving you more time to set more traps. Surprisingly innovative for the time is being able to find all kinds of mundane household objects and combine them into new weapons and traps to use. The Home Alone game had weapon crafting decades before it became en vogue for video games circa 2010. A Home Alone video game had all already been made by this point for the NES, SNES, Game Boy, and MS-DOS in 1991. However, those games were developed by Imagineering Inc., and the NES version was developed by Bethesda. Yes, that Bethesda. The Sega Genesis and European exclusive Master System versions were developed by Sega of America themselves. This is around the time when Sega was more committed than ever to beat Nintendo. One of their means of doing so was to take on development of third-party games directly to make sure their version was the best, such as the case with Home Alone, which they succeeded. It is the best version of the Home Alone video game and is pretty fun for like an hour, then it's pretty repetitive, but this is more fun to have than any of the other versions. Diving deep into the obscure, released this week in 1992, was Forgotten Worlds for the TurboGrafx CD. Forgotten Worlds is a side-scrolling shoot-'em-up from Capcom. You play as unknown soldiers floating around and blasting everything that comes your way, with each soldier having a different weapon. Blue Guy has a long-range machine gun, and Red Guy has a short-range wide shot. You can rotate to shoot in a whopping 16 directions for precision, collect money from defeated enemies, and power up in shops found throughout the stages. Forgotten Worlds was originally an arcade game from Capcom in 1988, 
Notably, the very first one to use their CPS-1 arcade board that would later go on to power hits like Final Fight and Street Fighter 2. Forgotten Worlds was ported to numerous home PC systems and the Sega Genesis and Master System in 1990. The Turbo CD version would be the latest, most up-to-date port of the game, taking full advantage of the CD format. This meant arcade quality graphics, CD quality music, and hilarious voiceovers for the cutscenes. <laughs> Did you find the guy? Today the Japanese version of the game was also released with a special three button controller for the Turbo Graphics, allowing for one button to rotate left, one to rotate right, and one to shoot. That controller never left Japan, which meant that the Western release had to make do with just two buttons. Also worse, the Turbo Graphics CD version of Forgotten Worlds does not have two-player co-op at all. Forgotten Worlds coming to the Turbo CD was seen as a big enough deal that gaming magazine Turbo Force, their answer to Nintendo Power, had a two-page spread covering that game alone. When each issue is only 30 pages long, that's a lot of real estate for one game. While you may not have heard of Forgotten Worlds before, you may recognize the characters. Suddenly, just now, you realize where the unknown soldier assist character from Marvel vs. Capcom 1 comes from. Hey man, get portable. Get a Game Gear Supersonic Sports Pack. When you have a breakout hit with a breakout star, the best way to capitalize on it is to make another one as fast as possible. Released November 24th, 1992 with Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Now, when you buy the Sega Genesis that comes with Sonic 1, you'll get Sonic 2 absolutely free. Sonic 2 handles stubborn stains, embarrassing bald spots, no problem. It even slices and dices, makes thousands of julienne fries. But wait, you can play it too. This free Sonic 2 is a $54.99 value. You get two Sonics for the price of one. Sonic 2 fits easily into any tackle box. Made from a space-age polymer plastic for years of family fun. And pets love it too. Buy the Sega Genesis that comes with Sonic 1 and get Sonic 2 free. Act now. Wiener Dog sweaters sold separately. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 delivers more of the same fast-paced gameplay of the original. Sonic runs, destroys enemies, goes through loops, and collects life-sustaining rings. He's got some new tricks up his sleeve, such as being able to spin dash, revving himself up into a ball to instantly get some speed and attack. Also introduced, of course, is Sonic's new buddy, Miles Tails Prower. Tails follows Sonic wherever he goes, mimicking his moves, getting in some extra hits, and more often getting left far, far behind. Incredibly innovative for the time, a second controller can be plugged in and allows another player to control Tails, allowing for some two-player co-op and for the younger sibling playing as Tails to inevitably be left far, far behind. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is also the game in the series that established is Super Sonic. Once Sonic has played enough bonus stages to collect all seven Chaos Emeralds, he can transform into the ultra-fast, ultra-powerful, and invulnerable Super Sonic. Now, in the 90s, Sonic the Hedgehog was already a big deal. His first game was a massive success for Sega, paving the way to become their franchise mascot and system seller. Going into 1992, the decision was made to pack every new Sega Genesis console to include a copy of Sonic 1, further ensuring that every Sega owner knew exactly who Sonic was and to be excited for his next game. And people were excited. Magazine previews showcasing Sonic 2 started at the beginning of the year. People were already meeting Tails, learning about the two-player modes, and being teased with that blistering speed that Sonic is known for. Sega had also sent an early prototype build of the game to Nickelodeon television show Nick Arcade to showcase it being played early albeit poorly. 1992 was also the year that Sega of America decided to go after Nintendo and hit them where it hurts. This was the year that Sega was determined to become the king of the console market, and all of their marketing plans were designed to insult Nintendo. The infamous blast processing commercials began in late 1992, and those featured the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog 2. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? And, uh, what if you don't have blast processing? Sega! 
The hype was real. People were ready for Sonic 2. Sega of America saw this as an opportunity to take it a step further. Posters asking, are you up to it? Free t-shirts for pre-ordering, approximately $10 million spent on advertising alone. They already had one of the most anticipated video games of the holiday season. How could they make it even bigger? By hyping it on a global scale. They were going to do something that no video game had done before it, a simultaneous worldwide release. November 24th, 1992 was a Tuesday. Sega celebrated the launch with a worldwide event called Sonic Tuesday. Events were held all over the world to showcase the release of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, happening in Japan, New York, London, and France. Sega wanted to treat the release of Sonic 2 with the same aplomb as a major movie release. Press releases, photo ops, people in Sonic costumes, and Sega also wanted big name celebrities there. But those were expensive but they could afford teen heartthrobs. Dustin Diamond, Joey Lawrence, Jonathan Taylor Thomas, and a whole lot of denim are just some of the few that were there to help promote the game and get kids excited. And it worked incredibly well. Gaming magazine review outlets also showered it with universal praise. GamePro magazine awarded it with a 4.5 out of 5 in every category. Electronic Gaming Monthly would go on to call it the best game for the Sega Genesis of 1992. And the Chicago Tribune newspaper deemed it runner-up for Game of the Year 1992. Nintendo's response to it all was conceding that Sega effectively stole Christmas from them. In the US alone, Sonic 2 sold a million copies in its first day. It broke sales records. Within a year, it became the best-selling 16-bit video game at that time. And to speak of Sonic's legacy to this day is almost redundant. The success of Sonic 2 skyrocketed him from beyond just a video game character, but to a pop culture icon. Starting the following year, there would be more Sonic games, multiple Sonic cartoon series, merchandise, going nonstop all the way to this day with more Sonic video games and feature film releases. Not bad for a video game that was made in less than nine months. What fool would try to go up against such a behemoth game release? Well, that fool's name is Linus Spacehead's Cosmic Crusade, also released this week for the NES in 1992. Linus Spacehead's Cosmic Crusade stars the alien Linus, who returns to the planet Earth with plans on taking as much video evidence as he can back to his home planet of Linoleum. Gameplay is half platformer, half point-and-click adventure. You can control and move Linus around, but also use typical adventure commands such as look, talk, give, and use with all kinds of environmental objects. This slow-paced gameplay is right alongside action sections of Linus jumping around platforms, collecting items, Items and traveling around the world, giving something more for kids to do than just a lot of reading. Linus Spacehead's Cosmic Crusade was developed by Codemasters and published by Comerica. And some of you may be scratching your head, asking yourself, why have I never heard of this game before? And that's because it's unlicensed. Comerica had been publishing games for the NES without Nintendo's licensing. It's why their games have a special switch on the back of the cartridge that you're supposed to flip when the game doesn't work. This switch works around the NES lockout chip, as seen on some of their other unlicensed games like the 4-in-1 Quattro cartridges. In fact, that's where this game comes from. Linus Spacehead's Cosmic Crusade is actually a sequel to the game Linus Spacehead that was a part of the Quattro Adventure collection. It's also one of the few games that was created for the Aladdin Deck Enhancer, an NES cartridge adapter meant to swap out other games easily and be cheaper. And I don't like it very much. It's hard to do a point-and-click game on the NES, and while this is a solid attempt at it, I don't think it's very good. But it's hard to be too critical of an unlicensed NES game. Something that's a little more beloved than that, released this week in 1992, was Out of This World for the SNES. Out of This World is a cinematic platformer for the Super Nintendo. This means slow, deliberate gameplay with well-animated, rotoscoped characters. You play as a scientist who ends up on a different planet trying to escape and survive. Attack and shoot enemies, solve puzzles, make a friend, and die over and over again. Out of This World is better known as Another World, as it was named everywhere other than America. It was also originally a PC release and it got ported to many consoles, such as this week 
week's SNES version. The Super Nintendo version was still a showcase piece. To see PC-like graphics on a little console was impressive for the time. The animations, the pseudo 3D environments, and cutscenes, many people wanted this just for the eye candy. It would get ported to even more consoles, including the new Sega CD and the 3DO, and eventually get a sequel called Heart of the Alien. It was developed by now legendary game developer Eric Chahi. All by himself, he did everything. The graphics, the storyboarding, the sound design. If you don't know him for his excellent work on Out of This World, you may also know him as the guy who made Heart of Darkness for the PlayStation 1. Out of This World, or Another World, also received critical acclaim upon release. People loved the original and were just as impressed by the SNES version. In IGN's Top 100 Games of All Time, they listed Out of This World at 69th place, which is nice. Not all things are deserving of a video game tie-in. Some things get it anyway. Released this week in 1992 was The Incredible Crash Dummies for the Nintendo Game Boy. The Incredible Crash Dummies has you playing as the dummies, Slick and Spin, doing a series of stunts to earn money. This means jumping off a building and hitting as many things as you can on the way down. Then driving a car while intentionally smashing into things and the wall at the end, going skiing while crashing into things, preventing good dummy parts from going into the bomb baskets on a conveyor belt, to finally launching a rocket ship into space. The Incredible Crash Dummies video game is based on the line of the popular Incredible Crash Dummies action figures in early 1991 from Tyco Toys. The popular toy line was based on a series of National Highway Traffic Safety Administration commercials in the late 1980s. Love your commercial safety belts, right? That's where you're going, man. I like the look, Mrs. She loves you guys. Just put seat belts in my gap. Nobody uses them. Guess they feel safe with me. We'd had half a brain. You buckled up. Hey, bump of breath, I do have half a brain. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. For some reason, people loved those commercials and the toys, so they got expanded to more merchandising in a 3D animated cartoon series. I was one of those kids that loved the dummies. I watched the animated stuff. The toys were sweet, like that car you could crash over and over, and I had these oversized stuffed animals of them. Only their arms, legs, and head were Velcroed on, so you could easily crash them, rip them apart, and put them together again. The Incredible Crash Dummies Game Boy game is one that I actually had as a kid. I played it tons and had more fun with it than you'd think. Look, as a young kid, any game that actively encourages you to break things is all kinds of fun. It also had some jamming tunes, as this was another game with music done by Greg and Tim Fallon, which also means that, yes, this game was published by LJN. Making its way onto the Super Nintendo this week in 1992 was Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia follows the story of an unnamed prince going through a series of dangerous traps, tunnels, and dungeons to rescue the princess from the evil Grand Vizier. The prince can run, jump, climb, and get into sword fights with enemies while solving puzzles, all within a time limit. Easier said than done, however, as there are numerous pitfalls and spike traps along the way. Prince of Persia was originally made for Apple II computers in 1989. It was also designed by Jordan Mechner, who also worked on Karataka. And much like Karataka, Prince of Persia uses rotoscope animation for highly detailed and realistic movement of the prince. In fact, the original Prince of Persia essentially created the cinematic platformer subgenre. The Super Nintendo version was different from the original release. The graphics were improved significantly, and the size of the levels were made bigger. In fact, it's longer overall. The home PC version had 12 levels and gave the player a time limit of one hour to get through all of them. The SNES version had 20 levels and extended the time limit to two hours. This game is no joke. It was difficult then, and it's difficult now. As a kid, it was hard to understand the fluid motions and the controls because of that, and that's not to mention how some of the puzzles left my brain hurting. Prince of Persia received critical acclaim. People loved it, not just for the original release, but also for the Super Nintendo version as well. 90s British television series Bad Influence reviewed the game in their 10th episode, giving it 4 out of 5 stars. It would go on to get sequels with Prince of Persia 2 in 1993, Prince of Persia 3D, and then the popular reboot with Prince of Persia Sands of Time in 2003, with more sequels, reboots, and eventually a feature film. Did anyone ever see that?
Arcade hits continue to make its way home, such as another release this week with Viewpoint for the Neo Geo AES. Viewpoint is a side-scrolling shoot-em-up with an isometric view. Fly your spaceship left and right and blast everything that comes your way. You can get two little helper guys to help you shoot, charge your main cannon for a more powerful shot, and it even has some environmental hazards like needing to shoot a gear to open up a gate. And of course, there's some oversized bosses at the end of each level. Viewpoint is another one of those Neo Geo games that was released for the arcades and for the home console at around the same time. It's also got two-player support, with each player taking turns. Interestingly, there is a simultaneous two-player co-op mode, but it's disabled by default and can only be activated using the arcade service menu. And since the home version doesn't have a service menu at all, this means the AES version doesn't have simultaneous two-player mode at all. It's still awesome to play. It's a great shoot-em-up, and the sprite graphics look so good to this day. It reminds me a lot of Zaxxon. Also, if you've never heard it before, Viewpoint has one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard. Every song is upbeat and funky. I love it. As did many others. By early 1993, it was reported that Viewpoint was the 15th most popular arcade title of the time. Review outlets praised the home version as well. GamePro Magazine awarded it with perfect fives across all categories, and Electronic Gaming Monthly selected Viewpoint for 1992's Best Graphics and Best Sound Awards. Viewpoint was ported to a couple of different systems. In 1994, it was ported to the Sega Genesis with mixed results. It looks and sounds good for a Sega game, but the abundant slowdown is painful. In 1995, it also got ported to the PlayStation 1, now with additional CG cutscenes and improved visuals. However, it still plays pretty slow and was made incredibly difficult. Though at least they made that funky future soundtrack sound even better. Am I going to the prom of a geek? Please say no. <sighs> Excellent chance. <laughs> you go to the prom of a geek? Okay, my turn. Do I have a secret admirer? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Never let clunkiness prevent you from trying something different. Released this week in 1992, was Gemfire for the Super Nintendo. Gemfire is a turn-based strategy game where you choose a faction and try to take over the entire map. Micromanage every part of your empire, allocating food, hiring soldiers, rearranging generals, do negotiations, and all kinds of other diplomatic boring things. Or, of course, you attack nearby territories and go into turn-based combat. You can move units individually, attacking from different angles matters, and try not to fall asleep with how slowly everything moves. Gemfire was developed and published by Koei, who is well known for similar games like Romance of the Three Kingdoms. There's a lot of familiarity with tons and tons of menus and honestly the graphics even look the same. It also means it has the same kind of slow paced gameplay perfect for strategy game enthusiasts or people who really like the board game Risk. A major difference for Gemfire compared to other Koei strategy games is that it's not based on any historic period or battle. It's pure fantasy, with the plot being about special gems being created into a crown that everyone is after, wizards, princesses, and you could even recruit monsters into your army. Gemfire was released in Japan as Super Royal Blood. The SNES version is also one of many, many ports. It was originally released onto PCs in Japan, like the PC-88 and the MSX, and in 1992, there were ports made for the NES, Sega Genesis, and DOS computers. Look, I like strategy games, but it's hard to have fun with them when they're this slow, even on the Super Nintendo. And this is coming from someone who really, really likes another Koei game, Aerobiz. And I'm not alone in thinking this either. Upon release, Gemfire did review pretty well. GamePro Magazine gave it lots of general praise, and so did Nintendo Power. But even Nintendo Power had to admit that the game is slow going a lot of the time. It didn't sell very well in the West, despite it being on numerous platforms. In Japan, however, it did well enough to warrant a sequel, titled Royal Blood 2 for PCs in 1999, where it has remained ever since. Also getting a port was the TurboGrafx CD, which saw its own version of Loom, this week in 1992. Loom is a point-and-click adventure game from LucasArts, hot off the heels of games like Maniac Mansion and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This means lots of walking around, interacting with every possible thing in the environment, and talking to every NPC until every dialogue option is exhausted. Loom, however, avoids the previous trappings of the item-based inventory and various verbs associated with them. Instead, it's based around using a magical instrument to play music. When notes are arranged in a certain order, magic spells are created to solve puzzles. Loom was originally released in 1990 for home computers on floppy disks and is the fourth game to use the 
Scum Engine for adventure games. It was then re-released in 1992 as a CD-ROM version, which notably added voice acting throughout the entire game. The TurboGrafx CD version, however, is based on the floppy disk version. While it has improved music, there is no voice acting. The original Loom also included a cassette tape that had a 30 minute audio drama setting up the world of Loom and the game's story picks up right where the audio drama leads off. On side B of that same tape was the game's soundtrack. Sadly, the TurboGrafx version does not include this tape at all. This is one that I've never personally played. I mostly played Sierra adventure games like King's Quest VI, so this was all new to me. Gotta admit, the music theme throughout is pretty cool though it is hard to play knowing there's a well-voice-acted version out there. Reviews for the TurboGrafx CD version were a bit mixed. GamePro, as is typical of them, gave it another near-perfect score. Electronic Gaming Monthly was a bit more divided. While some aspects of it were praised, the main drawback was the game's slow pace. I mean, it's a point-and-click adventure game. I'm not really sure what they expected. LucasArts followed this up by saying that Loom was a critical success, but not a commercial one. It didn't sell nearly as many units as they were hoping for. They had two sequels planned, Forge and The Fold, but were both canned. That's probably why there's an NPC in Secret of Monkey Island that tells you to buy Loom. Another week, another platformer. Released this week in 1992 was Chester Cheetah, Too Cool to Fool for the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Chester Cheetah, Too Cool to Fool stars the cartoon mascot for Cheetos, Chester Cheetah. It's essentially a platformer where you control Chester through numerous stages, jumping on enemies, very slowly walking forward and collecting Cheetos. Power-ups can only be described as very stupid. A guitar makes Chester get stuck in place while he jams out, only injuring enemies that get near him, and a pair of sunglasses that makes the screen get really, really dark and hard to see, but you're supposed to be able to find hidden items this way. He can also crawl in the sewers by pelvic thrusting the ground. Spend every level finding pieces of his busted motorcycle, rebuild it, and ride away from quote, Squaresville. Chester Cheetah was introduced as the mascot for Cheetos, a cheese-based crunchy corn puff snack in 1985. He spoke in basic hip-hop rhyme to come off as cool for kids, as he got into hijinks ripped straight off of Wile E. Coyote. No idea if he was actually popular enough at the time to warrant his own video game, but that's never stopped corporations from making a lot of unnecessary brand mascot video games. In all likelihood, this game was definitely made to promote Cheeto products, specifically Cheeto Paws, which were introduced in 1990. Chester Cheeto here with two cool laws for new Cheetos brand Paws. First, Paws bring big fun to young tongues. Like, check out Ross and this hip toss. That's real boss. Ooh, let's do law too. When filling your jaws with paws, it's only fair to share. So put it there, Claire. New Cheetos Paws, the cheese that goes I crunch. While not exactly discontinued, Ever since the mid-1990s, Cheeto Paws have been harder and harder to find. Look, the gameplay sucks pretty bad, but you can get a few laughs out of the instruction manual's poor translation while still attempting to rhyme. As is Chester Cheetah way, this is a one-person play. Also, the back cover had a coupon for 50 cents off a bag of Cheeto Paws. Upon release, it got way better reviews than it really should have. Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed it in January of 1993 with a lot of high scores. Now, I'm not saying that they were paid a lot of money for these scores, but I will point out that GamePro Magazine made it their cover for issue 41. Somehow, there would be a sequel released in 1993 called Chester Cheetah Wild Wild Quest. It also sucks, which makes sense. After all, it ain't easy being cheesy. Leave it to Capcom to milking their franchises as fast as possible. Released this week in December of 1992 was the Game Boy version of Mega Man 3. Mega Man 3 has you playing as Mega Man, jumping and shooting through a series of stages filled with dastardly robots. The plot this time around is Dr. Wily did something evil, blah blah blah, who cares? Summon your jet dog Rush, defeat all eight robot masters, gain their powers, and then take down Dr. Wily's castle for the umpteenth time, but handheld. Mega Man 3 for the Game Boy is not a direct port of the NES Mega Man game, rather an amalgamation. Mega Man now has the ability to slide from Mega Man 3, 
but can also charge up his Mega Buster like from the NES Mega Man 4. The stages also reflect this, as the first four Robot Masters are from Mega Man 3, Snake Man, Gemini Man, Shadow Man, and Spark Man. Then you do one Dr. Wily stage and then face four more Robot Masters, all from Mega Man 4. Dust Man, Skull Man, Dive Man, and Drill Man. Then it's off to Dr. Wily for real. The gameplay is exactly what you would expect from a Mega Man game. No more, nor less. And this can be seen as either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you ask. If you ask me, it's a great handheld Mega Man game that both looks and sounds as good as its NES counterparts. If you ask the reviewers of the time, same situation. Some places like Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed it positively, scoring high remarks all around and even receiving the Editor's Choice Gold Award, with the only real complaint wishing that the Game Boy could be in color. Other places said, it sure is Mega Man, and at this point, Capcom is beating a dead horse. Oh boy, are they in a surprise for the Mega Man series. Also notable for the Game Boy version of Mega Man 3 was the new Wily Stage boss, Punk. Similar to the Game Boy version of Mega Man 2, which had the boss, Anchor, Punk was a specific Mega Man killer bot. Punk would be the only Game Boy original character to also show up in the Mega Man Battle Network series. Punk would also show up later as a DLC boss fight in Mega Man 10. The Game Boy and Mega Man games were to get an enhanced collection for the Game Boy Advance in 2004, but that ultimately never finished. Mega Man 3 was then made available for the Nintendo 3DS eShop in 2014, which is set to close down in March of 2023. Speaking of stuff on portable consoles, this week in 1992 gave us Defenders of Oasis on the Sega Game Gear. Defenders of Oasis is a traditional turn-based RPG for the handheld. The story is based on the classic tale 1001 Nights, or Arabian Nights if you prefer. You play as a prince working to prevent the return of the dark god Araman. You can walk around town, talk to NPCs and purchase equipment. Battles take place in a simplistic first-person view, a la Dragon Quest, get experience points and level up with up to three additional party members joining you on the adventure. Unlike having a typical overworld map, there are areas in between important locations. Think something similar to Secret of Mana. Perhaps the most impressive thing about Defenders of Oasis is that it's a 1992 handheld RPG with an autosave feature. Defenders of Oasis is another one of those games that has wildly different box art from the Japanese version. In that, they're all in anime style, sure, but it does evoke their Arabian Nights theme that it was based on. The American box art, however, is not that but it's still fantastic. If that kind of Chad-like beefcake muscle man seems familiar to you, that's because this is another box art done by famed artist Julie Bell. She did other box art covers like Golden Axe. It got positive reviews when it released. GamePro Magazine gave it high scores, as did European magazine Sega Force. They both liked its honestly impressive graphics and sound. Video game retail store Babbage's reported that it was the seventh best selling Game Gear game. Completely coincidental, Defenders of Oasis, based on Arabian Nights, came out only two weeks after Disney's Aladdin. Despite the popularity of both, the game never got a sequel of any kind. However, it was not forgotten. Defenders of Oasis was made available on the Nintendo 3DS in 2012. Not to be left out, the Neo Geo Arcade and Home AES also got a release this week in 1992 with Art of Fighting. Art of Fighting is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Select a character, all with different moves and fighting style, then beat the crap out of each other until you win the best of three rounds. Each character also has a variety of special moves that can be executed using secret button commands, as was the style at the time. However, a spirit gauge drains with every special move used to help prevent spamming. You can recharge this by using a special taunt button against your opponent. There's even some special stages to boot, which can increase your maximum health and teach new special moves. SNK is no known to have numerous fighting game franchises, but Art of Fighting is only its second one. At the time, it was sort of a prequel to its first fighting game, Fatal Fury, and characters in other SNK games have connections to characters in Art of Fighting. It's like a weird SNK extended universe that's really hard to follow and isn't worth the effort. Art of Fighting also has some notable features, such as dynamic camera movement and characters getting bruised and having damaged clothes throughout the match. This kind of had plot relevance as the final boss, King, would get damaged and reveal that she's actually a woman. Now in the 90s, 
This was a crazy plot twist. When it came out, Art of Fighting was highly reviewed and popular. In arcades for December of 1992, it was the most requested conversion kit and the most profitable arcade game for the month. More notoriously, the main characters of Art of Fighting is a guy named Robert Garcia, who has slicked back hair and a very long ponytail. It also has a secondary protagonist with a character named Rio, who wears a karate gi, a headband, and throws energy fireballs out of his hands. Some people have pointed out that this bears an overwhelming resemblance to Ryu of Street Fighter. Capcom noticed this too, but they didn't sue SNK or anything. No, instead, in the game Street Fighter Alpha, they suspiciously introduced a character with slicked back hair with a very long ponytail, throws pitiful energy fireballs, wears a bright pink karate gi, and is the absolute weakest character in the game named Dan Hibiki. Table tennis balls flying. Dinner's ready. And a glide hockey game so fast yes. and furious. Good night, boys. There's no telling how long you'll play. More arcade favorites make its way to households. Released this week in 1992 with Sunset Riders for the Sega Genesis. Sunset Riders is a run and gun game set in the Wild West. Move to the right while shooting everything that isn't you. Shoot other cowboys, collect power-ups, dodge or exploit the occasional exploding barrel, and sometimes go into the nearby saloon for a quick smooch from the local dancing girls. At the end of each stage, you'll face off against a boss and sometimes get bonus stages to rack up additional points. Sunset Riders was originally released for the arcades in 1991 from Konami. There, it became an instant favorite, notably because it was four-player co-op, a growing trend for Konami arcade games at the time. Even better, the four playable characters all had different characteristics. Steve and Billy use the classic six-shooter revolvers, and when they get the second gun power-up, they hold the other at a 45-degree angle. Bob uses a rifle and Cormano has a shotgun, both that fire slower but has a wide bullet spread. The Sega Genesis version, however, doesn't have all that. It was ported onto a cartridge size of only Four megs, meaning only two playable characters are available, Billy and Cormano. Level designs were also drastically altered, and while the arcade original had eight stages with eight bosses, the Genesis version has four stages, split to two sections each, and only four bosses, and different bonus stages. Perhaps the most disappointing cuts are the numerous boss speeches they say when they die. Those were hilarious. Hasta la bye bye. Marry me with my money. However, the Sega port does feature something that is not available on any other version of Sunset Riders a two player versus mode. Not that anyone played it for the versus mode, it was meant for co-op through and through. Konami has a reserved history for the Sega Genesis. Though the system had been out for a few years already, Konami had trepidations about developing for it, instead making it clear that their main priority was the Super NES. The very first game that Konami made for the Sega Genesis was Sunset Riders, and was only available in North America. Not wanting to gamble too much on an unproven property, they kept the budget for the Sunset Riders port intentionally small, thus the smaller cartridge and the lack of fanfare and advertising for the game. For what it's worth though, Konami changed their tune about Sega with the release of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist. So like, a week from now. Sunset Riders in the arcade became an instant classic and was widely loved. The Sega Genesis Sunset Riders was received still pretty good. GamePro Magazine awarded it 4 out of 5s in every category, and GameFan Magazine put it with 93% scores. While good for its time, the Genesis port is considered to be the most inferior. In mid-1993, Sunset Riders would arrive on the Super Nintendo and would be arcade accurate, from stages to playable characters to voice samples. And the arcade version can be played now on the PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch from their online stores. Sega kept the hits coming. Released December 20th, 1992, was Streets of Rage 2 for the Sega Genesis. Streets of Rage 2 is a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you fight waves of enemies while walking to the right. Play as returning characters Axel and Blaze, along with two new characters, Max and Skate. Pick up weapons to use against enemies all while enjoying the amazing synthwave atmosphere with neon lights all over the place. You can still grab enemies, do that thing where you flip over them to throw them, and use a variety of special moves. Streets of Rage 2 is a first-party title from Sega for their hardware and is better than the original game in every conceivable 
unbelievable way, being the first 16 meg cartridge for the system. The sprites are bigger, there are even more enemies, the atmosphere is even better, there are more attacks, and it's incredibly well balanced. It also has some of the best music of any video game of the era. Seriously, give the soundtrack a listen, and all of those songs absolutely hold up to today's synthwave standards. It may sound trendy now, but back then, the music was considered revolutionary, one of the many ways it was ahead of its time. The first Streets of Rage was released in September of 1991, right at the same time as the release of the Super Nintendo. It was seen as Sega's answer to Final Fight, which was coming out for the SNES just a couple of months later. Arguably, Streets of Rage 2 is better than any of the SNES Final Fight games. It's considered to be that good. To this day, it's widely considered to be one of the best beat-em-up games of all time, and one of the best Sega Genesis games you can find. It sold incredibly well despite such a late holiday release. Video game retail store Babbage's reported that it was in the top five best-selling Sega Genesis games all the way through March of 1993. There would be a Streets of Rage 3 in early 1994, but then the series lay dormant for decades. It was included in online stores and compilations, but not a true sequel was in sight. Did you ever see that weird PS1 game in the late 90s called Fighting Force? That was originally supposed to be Streets of Rage 4. Of course, we know now in the future that there would finally be a Streets of Rage 4 in 2020. Good games can come from unexpected mascots. Released this week in 1992 was The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse for the Super Nintendo. The Magical Quest sees Mickey Mouse on an adventure to rescue his dog Pluto, who has run off during a game of fetch, which is Goofy's fault. It's a side-scrolling platformer which has Mickey jumping and taking out enemies by either jumping on them or by throwing objects and enemies themselves. The further you get into the game, the more magic costumes you get for Mickey. The firefighter can use the water hose to take out enemies, the magician can shoot a magical blast, and the mountain climber gets a grappling hook. You can swap between them at any time, and they're used differently for a lot of platformer elements. For example, the firefighter hose makes ice platforms in the ice level. The Magical Quest was developed and published by Capcom and is the first Disney game from Capcom for the SNES. It predates other beloved Disney SNES games like Aladdin and Goof Troop. It's also a visually impressive game for the SNES. Huge, well-animated character sprites that evoke that Disney feel really well with some varied level designs and boss fights. It's also a quick, chill playthrough. There's unlimited continues and it isn't very difficult, which honestly works well since it's such a relaxing game to play and it's one of those better than it looks kind of games. A well-made Disney game coming to the SNES was seen as a big enough deal that it graced the cover of Nintendo Power Issue 44, complete with a multi-page walkthrough. It also reviewed super well. Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it straight 9s out of 10, calling it one of the most visually impressive games they've seen yet. Game Pro Magazine also liked it a lot, aside from the music. Side note, I actually kind of agree with that. So many things sound like a fart in this game. The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse sold near 1.2 million copies and became the first part in a trilogy. Magical Quest 2, The Great Circus Mystery, would grace the SNES and Genesis in 1994, and there would be a Magical Quest 3 for the Super Famicom, though all three would get ported to the Game Boy Advance in early 2000s. Carol. Squeaking in one last game of the year is Capcom. Released on December 29th, 1992, was Mega Man 5 for the NES. Mega Man 5 continues the story of Mega Man by basically having the exact same story as every other Mega Man. Dr. Wily has made eight more robot masters for Mega Man to defeat in any order. He'll run and jump to get through all of their stages, acquire their powers upon defeat, and use those to exploit the weaknesses of every boss. Mega Man can still slide and charge up his Mega Buster, but a few things have been added to his arsenal. The Rush Coil now springs his robot dog up with him, allowing Mega Man to jump from there. He also has a new companion, the Bird B. Beat. Finding every letter of Mega Man 5 in the eight stages unlocks a Beat, who can be summoned to automatically attack enemies on the screen. Mega Man 5 was developed to intentionally be a more accessible entry in the franchise. It was made to be much easier than previous games. It's why the fully charged Mega Buster has such a huge shot. 
it charges up faster than it did before, and the bigger sprite made it easier for players to hit their targets. Also introduced was the M tank. Unlike the E tank, which can be used to restore Mega Man's life whenever he needed, or the W tank, which can restore his special weapon energy, the M tank fully restores both. And if it's used while already at maximum life and energy, the M tank turns all on-screen enemies into extra lives. The special weapons all kind of suck though. The charge kick just made you take more hits whenever you use it, the power stone is impossible to hit anything with, and the water wave can't even be used in the air. That said, as a kid, I loved the upside down parts of Gravity Man's stage. Much like the previous entries, Capcom held a design contest for some of the robot masters to be created by fans. It got 130,000 different entries. One of the winners was Crystal Man, drawn by a young Yusuke Murata, who would also go on to be the artist for the manga series one Punch Man. Look, there was a new Mega Man game every year starting with 1990's Mega Man 3 and franchise fatigue was real. Still, Mega Man 5 reviewed positively when it came out, with Nintendo Power awarding it a 3.9 out of 5 and Electronic Gaming Monthly giving it some pretty high scores, but noted that it's starting to get pretty tired and that the series should quote jump to 16 bits already. Imagine their surprise in about one year from now. Electronic Arts was still showing some love to the Sega Genesis. Also released this week in 1992 for the console was Road Rash 2. Road Rash 2 is a sequel to the motorcycle racing game. Hop on your bike into illegal street races, avoiding traffic, boulders, cows, other racers, and the police as you try to take first place. Use your prize money to upgrade your bike, buy nitros, and get taunted by other racers. Throw those taunts back into their faces by beating the crap out of them, punch them, kick their bikes, steal their own weapons to use against them. Sometimes you win by hitting the finish line in first place. Other times you win because you made sure you're the only surviving racer. Road Rash 2 is a follow-up to Road Rash 1 from 1991 and has a lot of much needed improvements over the original. There's more variety in the courses you race on, from Vermont to Alaska to Hawaii. There are 15 obtainable motorcycles and a chain was added as a weapon. The biggest improvement was done to the two-player mode. The original had it as two players taking turns and Road Rash 2 has two players simultaneous play, with each player taking half of the screen and getting half the frames per second. I loved this game as a kid. One of my childhood friends had a Sega Genesis and owned Road Rash 2, and we had a blast with it. We would play two players and make it as cooperative as possible. He'd win the race, and I would focus on killing the computer opponents to help make sure he would win. As kids, we were not bothered at all by the choppy graphics. We were having too much fun. Advertising for Road Rash 2 was weird, though. The magazine page basically said that, hey, Road Rash 2 now has a two-player mode and encouraged you to beat up your dad in game. Road Rash 2 was developed in a single year, always intending to be on store shelves before Christmas of 1992, and they barely made it. It was enough time to make a solid sequel that reviewed super well. GamePro Magazine gave it high scores in every category. Electronic Gaming Monthly rated it pretty well. Every reviewer praised the new simultaneous multiplayer mode, a much needed addition. They also all said the same thing. It was too similar to the first one. Maybe they would have had more fun if they didn't play it with their dad or whatever. I don't know. Road Rash would go on to get numerous sequels and ports. Perhaps the weirdest one is that the popularity of Road Rash allowed Electronic Arts to create a spin-off series to capitalize on another major early 90s trend, rollerblading. In 1994, they used the Road Rash 2 engine to create Skitchen, which is Road Rash, but on rollerblades. Radical. Speaking of Radical, released this week in December of 1992, was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist for the Sega Genesis. Hyperstone Heist is another side-scrolling beat-em-up starring the Ninja Turtles. Take control of Leo, Mike, Don, or Raph to beat up hundreds of Foot Clan soldiers and several iconic bosses at the end of each stage. Jump, kick, shoulder tackle, and do that thing where you grab them and slam them back and forth to hit nearby foes. Although there is no throwing enemies at the screen. Hyperstone Heist was based largely off of Konami's hit arcade game, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, but is not a direct port, even though it uses a lot of the same graphics and the exact same music. Whereas the other one is about the turtles going through time, Hyperstone Heist is about the Shredder shrinking down the city for whatever evil purposes. Also in the intro sequence, I have never seen the Shredder look so shredded, god damn! 
Hyperstone Heist takes Turtles in Time stages and combines them or remixes them all together. This means the stages are way longer, but there's also fewer of them, five in total. It also means bosses are switched around. For example, the stage one boss is Leatherhead. You fight Rocksteady twice, but no Bebop, Baxter Stockman before he becomes a fly, and in a surprising addition, Tatsu from the first and second live action TMNT movies is a boss. Now, there is a reason for this. This is still around the time that Nintendo had a tyrannical grip over certain third-party publishers. They basically demanded that certain games have at least a year of timed exclusivity on the Super NES. But there were workarounds though, as done by companies like Capcom and Konami. See, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist isn't a copy-pasted port of Turtles in Time like the one on the SNES. It's so different, it's essentially its own new game. At least this was the excuse Konami used to get a Ninja Turtles game onto the Sega Genesis and avoid the ire of Nintendo's lawyers. It's a good thing they did too, because Hyperstone Heist is a really, really good Sega game. It graced the cover for the January 1993 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly, where inside they reviewed the game with lots of praise. While they understandably compared it to its Super Nintendo cousin, lamenting the loss of the enemy to screen throwing in less levels, it was still seen as a solid Sega game with fun two-player modes. Hyperstone Heist would remain on the Sega Genesis and would not see a port or even any kind of downloadable release. However, it would finally become available on modern consoles in August of 2022 when it was included in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Cowabunga Collection. <laughs>